you can use a little bit of a sample, not even a full second, and they will find you. There's this new technology. I'm just going to show it to you. It's, it's terrifying. We need to continue this conversation about sampling because after my last video about the fair use doctrine and how it really didn't apply to sample based beats, a bunch of commenters made it very clear that in the producer community, there is this knowledge gap when it comes to copyright uh, and intellectual property law and sampling, how that fits in. So these top three myths and questions that came up in the comments section, I think are really important and that's why I'm making this video. The first myth uh, that I wanna address in this video is the idea that copyright infringement only happens when someone is making money off of somebody else's copyrighted material. Let, let's just start with the word copyright and break that word down. Copyright, the right as in the legal ability to copy, as in duplicate. Copyright law has nothing to do with money. Copyright law has to do with the right to copy. Now, I know people don't always believe me, which is fine. I taught you not to believe me. I taught you to be skeptical. Go to copyright.gov, read their FAQ. Their FAQ is incredibly helpful when it comes to all things related to copyright law, even insofar as the music business specifically is concerned. Check this out. What is copyright infringement? As a general matter, copyright infringement occurs when a copyrighted work is reproduced, distributed, performed, publicly displayed, or made into a derivative work without the permission of the copyright owner. Never, nowhere in there, do you see the word sale? Do you see the word money? Do you see the word profit? As you saw beneath what I was just reading you, um, the copyright FAQ goes on to discuss P2P networks so torrents that kind of thing consider this distributing or downloading a torrent of a disney pixar film obviously is a copyright violation but there's no money exchanged in that scenario if i downloaded a disney pixar film and spent my own money to duplicate a thousand copies on dvd and went and handed those out for free would I be violating a copyright law? Yes, I would. Everyone knows that. So sampling, even if not for profit, even if there's no money involved, you don't make a cent off of it. Even if you upload it to a non-monetized platform, whoever you sampled can still take legal action. Now, realistically speaking, you'll probably fly under the radar. If they do catch you, most likely the worst case scenario is that you get a copyright claim and they just monetize your content or they uh, actually remove your content. It generally doesn't go beyond that. Unless, of course, you've lied to a record label and you've sold a beat to Lil Baby and you swore up and down to Atlantic Records that there was no sample there, then, then you're in some trouble. That's why I go so hard on these sample makers who sell even. Some of them, they give them away for free. But some of you are out here selling samples you don't own to other producers and not disclosing that this is work copyrighted by somebody other than you. My mind is blown that people actually do this. Let's get into the second myth. This is huge because it goes right back to the very core of what the music business is, which is just the, the sale, licensing, and collection of royalties from the exploitation of the two main copyrights, the two only copyrights, that are generated from a recorded piece of music. Now, please pay attention to this, because I got a ton of comments that show me how many of my viewers don't understand this thing. Got the Pisces says, the best thing to do is make like Dr. Dre and have musicians replay the parts you want to sample. Dad J mixes it, says, why not just use a sample replay service to avoid the headache and just get the approval for the mechanical? or am I way off the mark? You are, and I'll explain why. Zola P says, can you ever get in trouble for remaking a sample? Yes, you can. So let's go back to my favorite chart, the flow of money in music. These are the two copyrights to every recorded piece of music. This is unique to the music business. You cannot compare real estate to the music business. You cannot compare photography to the music business. A song has these, this is unique to songs. They have these two um, copyrights automatically when they are created the master recording and the composition 
The master recording is the actual recording of the song. The composition is, they say, think sheet music. So th anything that can be written down on sheet music and then replayed by other musicians, not recorded audio, I could hand this, this um, underlying composition to another band, to another uh, guitar player, somebody, and they could, reading the notes, reading the lyrics, record their own version, their own master recording of my underlying composition. So when you sample something, say you sample an old song, right? You are actually infringing on both of these copyrights. Well, you're not technically infringing y quite yet in a, in a practical sense, but what that means is you have to clear both of these copyrights. So someone commented about the story that I told. A lot of people were speculating who I was referring to when I said I lost my publishing to a dead man. I'm using the term publishing loosely to just mean everything that falls under this umbrella. And when the gentleman who commented about mechanicals, uh, mechanicals are just a specific type of royalty under the underlying composition copyright umbrella. A lot of people think mechanical royalties are the same as master recording royalties and they're actually very different as you can see they're in completely different positions on this chart so make this chart your best friend because when something about the music business confuses you this is a great roadmap we're just going to go straight to who sampled and we're going to talk about it so i sampled willie hutch rest in peace so when i said that before the album even dropped my royalty account was at negative fourteen thousand dollars this is what i meant right they paid me, the label paid me $4,000 for the beat. That's an advance. When they say advance, that means an advance on royalties, on royalty points. Royalty points are generally between 3% and 5% of whatever royalty rate the rapper is getting based on your song. So that's why I said it was a fraction of a fraction. And what the label will do then is they will charge your account with any expense that is related to the production of that record. And your account has to generate that money back so that it's beyond zero, so that's, that it's at a positive balance before they pay you. A lot of people say uh, or it advances a loan. I have a problem with that because if your bank account is in the negatives, you actually owe that money. If your royalty account at a record label is in the negatives, you don't owe that money, you just, hope that it generates beyond zero so you actually start making money so it's not a it's not a loan but i said fourteen thousand, not four right that is because def jam had to clear the master recording of the sample and that cost ten thousand i believe so they charged that against my future royalties so now my future royalties were at least negative fourteen thousand when the album dropped probably more because of engineering and all these other costs that they most likely um, charge against my account. This is a problem with the labels. I don't want to go off on a tangent about recoupment, but they don't ever tell you what they're recouping against you. You would have to hire a, like a lawyer or a forensic accountant to actually audit the label. And it's like, I got to pay thousands of dollars for that just to see why I'm not making money. It doesn't make sense, but that's how they get you. So back to this sample, right? First of all, it's Motown, right? Motown is not a small label by any means. And as I said, and as maybe you already know, record labels tend to own masters, right? And so the master would have to be cleared by Motown. But what about the underlying composition? That's the second copyright. So who potentially had to give permission for that? Uh, well, look at all of these. <laughs> look at all of these players. I don't know which one of them actually owns any part of the underlying composition because a lot of them are session players um, and it looks like willie hutch is the arranger the producer and the writer uh so you know in theory he may be the only person who owns the underlying composition he may be the sole owner of that but regardless that's still two people that they had to clear it with. And again, Willie Hutch is unfortunately deceased, so they would have to clear it with his estate. And then they would have to call the shots. That's why I lost all of my um, equity in the underlying composition. Do I think it's fair? No. Do I think it's, it's the way the music business works? Yeah, that is. I'm not saying any of this stuff is fair. I'm not telling you clear every sample you make. 
I'm not telling you any of this other than how the law works. That's it. So remember, the original question was, why don't you just get someone to replay the samples? Why don't you just replay the sample? Because the idea is if you replay the sample, you don't have to clear it, right? You, you created it yourself. No. What you've effectively done is created a cover version of an existing composition. So you're not using the master recording. You're not actually sampling the audio, but you're taking the underlying composition, all the notes, the rhythms, everything, the chord progressions, everything, melodies, and you're creating a new master recording. And so therefore, you still have to clear this copyright. Otherwise, you would be infringing on it. That means in my case, if I had replayed that Willie Hutch sample, all right, we didn't need to talk to Motown about it. They own the master. I'm not sampling the master. But I am sampling the underlying composition, which is called an interpolation. And therefore, I would need to clear it with Willie Hutch and potentially that whole um, host of musicians that contributed to the writing and production of that track. So why would anybody replay a sample if it's not really going to help them avoid sample clearance completely? Well, if you can replay it yourself, I'm not saying go out and, and hire a company to do it because you're going to just spend that money and potentially not get it back from the label. If you can play it yourself, you increase the chances of getting it cleared because they're only having to clear it with the writers, the songwriters and the publishers and not the label. Also, the label you're selling the, the beat to might like you better because you've made their lives easier and you save them some money. They don't have to pay that clearance fee. You've also boosted your sample replay resume and maybe if word gets out that you have that skill set, other individuals, labels, production companies, who knows, will seek you out and pay you to replay samples so that they can avoid that master clearance fee. You've also increased the likelihood that your royalty account will be in the positive quicker, right? So for me, that $10,000 that it took to pay for the master clearance went against my future royalties. But if there hadn't been that $10,000 charge working against me, I probably would have gotten a check from Def Jam. Now there are other alternatives too. Uh, if you have a good relationship with the label, with the a and whoever is in charge of this project that you submitted a sample-based beat to. And I've done this before. I've done this. Actually, I can tell this story because Static Selector went public and talked about this. There was a Wiz Khalifa record that contained a sample. Um, the people who owned the sample wanted $80,000 to clear it. So Static contacted me in Dream Life, and I forget who all was involved it could have just been me and him, but it also could have included memory and stack trace. Either way, we created an entirely new sample. We didn't replay the sample. We created a new sample that fit with the track, and that saved them that $80,000. Also, there was another time I thought I was going to lose this record, I, and this turned out to be a platinum and a gold record. This sample was going to ruin the whole thing. This, this sample was going to take away a platinum and a gold record from me if I didn't figure out a way to uh, get around it. So thankfully, thankfully, I found a way. And this is what I did. And I'm talking about the uh, Push Ice G Herbo record, Switch It Up. I've told this story in long form elsewhere, so check that out on my channel. But it was a blessing in disguise. The sample was old. Gold Haze and um, JD Feng had flipped it and then asked me what the source of it was. Actually, that the Atlantic Records a &R asked me what the source of it was, and I was like, look, this sample, I don't know what, it's from an old computer, it's seven years old. Can I just play something different that will fit the track? They didn't want to do it at first. I had to really talk them into it, and in spite of all the controversy, they accepted one of the, the 16 versions I made. Album went platinum, single went gold. <sighs> I was stressed out. And here is the last myth I want to cover, but it's an important one because emerging technology is getting terrifying. Dr. Jonesy says, alternatives, make your own beats with no samples. Okay, that's not really an alternative to sampling, whatever. Or sample, but sample so heavy, nobody knows what it is. 
Let's talk about that. You can use a little bit of a sample, not even a full second, and they will find you. There's this new technology. I'm just going to show it to you. It's, it's terrifying. According to the creator of uh, this particular video, this was um, done using Google's song recognition. I, I don't know what that is, but watch this. So that little piece was found by Google's technology in a Daft Punk song. Daft Punk are masters of sampling. No one's even saying that that is a certain for sure 100% accurate hit, right? That might not actually be a sample. That could just be someone playing a guitar and it sounds very similar. And that's scary because think about Content ID that misidentifies a track as copyright infringement and then takes it down. Think about what this means for music that over decades has existed with maybe very short bits of sampled materials in it. And now somebody, some publisher, someone comes up and buys up a bunch of catalogs of old music and runs all that music through this technology. And suddenly they're getting hits here and there. And, and by the end of it, they found a thousand songs that potentially infringe on their, their now newly acquired copyrights. Could be all bad. Could really be all bad. I mean, all those people thought I was anti-sampling in the last video. I don't know why. I, I sample all the time. And like I said, it, that started my career. This, this is scary. This is scary. This could mean everyone's getting demonetized or maybe threatened or maybe getting their catalogs wiped. I don't know. It's something to watch. Definitely something to watch. So as I said in my last video, I'm not here to, to scare you into not sampling or anything like that. If you choose to, to uh, be scared by what I'm saying, that's your choice. That's not my intention. Um, I just want everyone to be educated so they know what to expect. They know what their options are. They know what their rights are. And they can walk into a situation feeling more positive and less anxious about potential outcomes. Appreciate you tuning in. Thank you so much. Peace.